What's up, everybody? Hope you're doing well. Welcome back. Um, so we're going to review Unit 3 today. Uh, I'm really excited. I'm glad so many of you have decided to spend your Saturday, I guess now it's afternoon if you're on the East Coast here with me. Um, maybe you woke up for this, uh, and that's really awesome. So uh, thanks again for stopping by. Uh, what we're going to do in this video is we're going to go over Unit 3. So um, this should be pretty similar to how we did yesterday in the uh, Unit 2 review. Actually, just kidding. Um, I just pulled up the wrong thing. I'm ready for the wrong video right now. So just give me just one moment real quick. Let me pull up my Unit 3 review, which is in my email. So um, I'm just going to talk for a minute. Um, all right, so there are three reviews today. So uh, this one right now, uh, we have uh, this is where we're going to go over Unit 3. I'm not going to focus on the Supreme Court cases uh, on this one. Uh, we will obviously go over them because it's impossible not to, uh, but we're going to go over the cases um, a little bit more in the next, uh, like tomorrow, I'm going to do a Supreme Court review. So I'll review the cases specifically uh, tomorrow. And then um, at 1 o'clock today, we're going to do a Kahoot on Unit 3. And at two o'clock, I'm gonna go over a concept application FRQ. Now the very first live review video that I did was um, a, what's it called? It was a uh, review on the concept application FRQ. Those of you who saw that, you already know that it changed, um, that we don't have, that they added a couple of tasks to it. So it is different than it was, um, so that is, new and hopefully exciting. We're going to go with exciting. I don't know if that's actually true or not, but we're going to say it's exciting. Um, so we're going to go over that today. Um, that'll be at two o'clock. Um, I have a, a new prompt, a second prompt that we're going to do with that one. So um, again, that should be good review. All right, so we are all set. We are going to do our unit three review. Um, feel free to ask questions in the chat. Um, I do have slow chat on, so um, hopefully that can reduce the amount of spamming in the chat. Um, but do feel free to ask questions. Um, I am going to check over and look at the chat and try to, uh, to answer questions that people have. The goal is for this to be about 30, 35 minutes or so, and then we'll take a little break and we'll be back at one o'clock and we'll do a coot and it'll be awesome. All right. Um, so civil liberties and civil rights, that's what unit three is all about. And civil liberty, it's important to distinguish between them. Um, it's a huge pet peeve of mine. I hate when people use civil liberties and civil rights as if those are interchangeable terms because they're definitely not interchangeable. Um, so we're going to start with civil rights. The whole, probably the first three-fourths of the unit is civil liberties and then we do a little bit of civil rights. The biggest difference, there's kind of two main differences between civil liberties and civil rights. Civil liberties, we're talking about individual freedoms. So individual people, civil liberties. You have the freedom to do something. You have the freedom to speak your mind. You have the freedom to believe and worship the way that you want to. You have the freedom to bear arms. These are civil liberties. Civil rights, we're not talking about individual people. Now we're talking about people as groups, so groups of people. And instead of this being the freedom as a group to do something, instead, this is the freedom for a group to be free from discrimination, to be free from uh, some kind of negative behavior pressure against that group. So. Civil rights, we're protecting groups from discrimination, and that gives power to the government to do that. Civil liberties, we're talking about taking power away from the government, not letting the government do something, not letting the government restrict your freedom. So that's kind of the fundamental uh, difference between civil liberties and civil rights. Again, that's a pretty major concept um, that I'd want you to feel comfortable with. Now, the Bill of Rights is uh, where we find a kind of list of our civil liberties, the ones that specifically the federal government can't take away from us. Um, originally, the Bill of Rights only protected people from the federal government. Uh, we will very, very shortly get into how that changed um, in the last hundred years or so. Um, but initially, the Bill of Rights, they just protected people from the federal government, said the government can't take away certain rights. And if you think about the very first words of the First Amendment, it says, Congress shall make no law. It doesn't actually say, hey, everybody has the freedom of speech. What it says is Congress can't make a law taking away your freedom of speech or your freedom of religion and these other freedoms and rights that we have. All right. Um, so I think that's a pretty good overview of that. 
Um, all right, incorporation. This is without a doubt the single most important vocab term in unit three. Um, it's probably in the top five most important vocab terms in AP Gov, especially this condensed version of AP Gov. Um, the AP exam loves to have people write about this. This makes a great FRQ or argument essay uh, thing to be involved because of how significantly it changes the entire relationship between states and the federal government, um, how it alters people's rights or how those rights are being protected. It changes everything. Um, and so they love to ask about this. So this is by far the number one most important idea in unit three that you want to feel 100% comfortable with. Um, so what is incorporation? Well, you have a definition on the screen. It says the Bill of Rights applies to the states and limits the power of state governments. So the first part is really the definition. It is applying the Bill of Rights to the states. Now, it's important to understand what those words mean. The Bill of Rights, remember, it weakens a government. The Bill of Rights originally said the federal government can't take away your speech or your right to bear arms, search you illegally, all those things, right? Now, with incorporation, now the Supreme Court is saying, you know what? The Bill of Rights also stops states from doing those same things. So this is a limitation, a restriction on the power of state governments. State governments, after a right is incorporated, they can no longer take away that right. That means that before the right is incorporated, that they could take away that right. So again, this shifts the balance of power between states and the federal government in a major, major way. So where does this idea come from? Because the Supreme Court starts doing this in 1925. Um, they didn't quite make it up out of thin air, but there's nothing in the Constitution that directly uses this term. So like, where did this come from? Um, well, second bullet point says it's based on the 14th Amendment's due process clause. Now, those of you who are really good with your amendments, you know already that the Fifth Amendment gave us due process. It said that the government couldn't take away your life, liberty, or property without due process of law. That's the due process clause in the Fifth Amendment. But this says based on the 14th Amendment's due process clause. And that's because the 14th Amendment basically restates the Fifth Amendment, but it adds a little twist on it. This time it says, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. So for the first time, be in a constitutional amendment is really, I shouldn't say for the first time, but in a major way, in a new and major way, the constitution now is restricting states very, very specifically. Um, saying states cannot take away your life, liberty, or property either. And then about 50 years goes by, and then in 1925, in a Supreme Court case, the Supreme Court is like, hey, you know what? When it says that the states can't take away your life, liberty, or property without due process, liberty, that means freedom. So that means states can't take away your freedom of speech. And then a few years later, they decide, you know what? And that means they can't take away your freedom of the press. And then a few years later, they decide that they can't take away your freedom of religion, establishment clause, and etc. So the last bullet point hits on a really important thing, which is that the Bill of Rights has been selectively incorporated. So we have selective incorporation, meaning that the entire Bill of Rights was not applied to the states at one single moment in time. Rather, this has been done over time on a case-by-case -case basis. In fact, in 2019, we just had another incorporation case. It was part of the Eighth Amendment um, that was going against excessive bail. That was just now incorporated. The right to bear arms, just incorporated in 2010. Um, so this has been happening. It's been literally 95 years that this process has been continually going on. Again, you want to have a really good uh, grasp of all of this stuff, um, talking about how it changes the balance of power, states and federal. It empowers the Supreme Court, right? Um, so huge, hugely important idea there with incorporation. All right, so now getting into the amendments a little bit more, um, I'm going to start going a little bit faster probably. That was such an important idea. I wanted to go over that thoroughly, so hopefully you guys feel good on uh, the incorporation stuff. Freedom of religion, we break into two parts. So if you do have some kind of uh, religion prompt on the AP exam, saying freedom of religion will not be an acceptable answer. All right, freedom of religion is actually two parts. Um, there is the Establishment Clause and there is the Free Exercise Clause. All right, so 
Um, you see there in that little graphic, it says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. That's the establishment clause or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That's the free exercise clause. So two parts. Establishment says that Congress, and now since it has been incorporated, states cannot uh, create or establish an official religion is what that means. More importantly than that, because that's you know not that realistic to happen these days, but they also cannot give preferential treatment for certain religions over another or for religion in general. Um, so they are supposed to be pretty neutral when it comes to uh, religious involvement. So this is where we're talking about like that wall of separation between church and state. We're thinking of the establishment clause. The free exercise clause is that you have the right to practice your preferred religion. Um, again, there can be limits on this, so don't go crazy. No, you can't commit murder and be like, oh, but my religion says it's okay. You can't smoke weed and be like, my religion says it's okay. That doesn't work. Stuff that's illegal is still illegal. Um, but you do have a right to practice your religion, and that is based on the free exercise clause. All right? Speaking of religion, we have a couple of Supreme Court cases, again, I'm going to go over your cases in the live review tomorrow, or one of the live reviews tomorrow. I'm going to have a, several tomorrow. Um, and I'll go over these really detailed, giving you the facts, the holding, and the constitution, constitutional principle. But for right now, big picture stuff. State-sponsored prayer in public schools violates the Establishment Clause, so it struck down public school prayer. Um, again, can an individual student say their own prayer while they're at school? Yes, absolutely, of course. Can your teacher in a public school lead you in prayer? No, and that's because of Ingle versus Vital. Um, the big thing here is it's the establishment clause because that would be the government essentially promoting religion. Wisconsin versus Yoder is another religion case. It also involves school, but in this case, uh, it's a free exercise issue. Um, so you had Amish families that didn't want to send their uh, kids to public school for high school. Um, because of the religious values that they had that they felt were in conflict with what their, their children would learn at public school. Um, and so, yeah, the Supreme Court agreed with the Amish families and they said, yeah, making this religious group send their kids to school after eighth grade, it does violate the free exercise clause or free exercise rights. So they let them practice their religion, including by not sending their kids to school at that moment. All right, so now we move on to freedom of speech. Everybody's favorite, right? You can also call this freedom of expression. It means the same thing. It's just a slightly more broad way of saying it. Um, so a couple things. We are going to get to Schenck versus U.S. in a minute. Um, what I have there, the first bullet point, that is the current Supreme Court case law as far as when speech can be limited. Um, you honestly probably don't need to know it that specifically. Um, what would be better to be on here is that speech that there can be time, place, and manner restrictions on free speech. So rather than me focusing on the imminent lawless action, that's what I'm going to focus on, um, is that there can be time, place, and manner restrictions on free speech. Um, so the government can't take away your free speech rights, but they can tell you not here, not now. All right. Now, some people would say that the government shouldn't be able to do that either. We're not going to get into that debate. That's a good debate for an FRQ, actually, for the argument essay, where you would talk about time, place, and manner restrictions and take a position on whether or not those are constitutional or not. And you could talk about some of the case law like Tinker and Schenck versus U.S. Um, but currently, the Supreme Court says, yes, states and the federal government can make time, place, and manner restrictions on speech. Now we have types of speech that are restricted and we have types of speech that are unrestricted. Um, symbolic speech and hate speech, those are protected speech. Those are protected forms of speech. Symbolic speech, we're talking about things like, I don't know, a black armband. Uh, we're talking about having, um, you know, symbols, um, shirts, clothing, signs, banners, somebody taking action, burning the American flag. That is symbolic speech. Hate speech is pretty clear what that is. Those are both constitutionally protected. Types of speech that are not protected would include things like libel, slander, obscenity, fighting words. It's words that are intended to incite violence. Um, those are not protected. All right. Um, bump, bump, bump. Just real quick, I'm going to glance over at the chat. Um, Isabella is asking about homeschooling. Wisconsin versus Yoder is the case that really opened the door to homeschooling. Um, that's it's realistic. It's not what the AP exam cares about, but realistically, that's... Uh, that is the biggest thing. Um, Emily asked if uh, Shank was overruled by Brandenburg. Um, it was 
I overruled is a little bit strong, but it was refined and it was narrowed. There were other cases before that, Gitlow versus New York refined it. There are about five or six speech cases that refined Schenck. Um, so this Schenck versus U.S. that's on the screen right now, that is not 100% current um, Supreme Court case law that they would go by. I'll talk about why they want you to know it anyway. Um, all right. What's the test that goes with eminent lawless action? Was that lemon test? Lemon test is the test used to determine if a law violates the establishment clause. So lemon test goes with the establishment clause. Um, eminent lawless action is just kind of that series of questions I think I had on the last slide. Um, if is it intended to and is it likely to produce eminent lawless action? So is the goal of the speech to make somebody break the law and is it likely to actually happen? as a result of that speech. Those are, that's the questions with that one. All right, Schenck versus U.S. This is a restriction of free speech, so that's how you would use this case. It is definitely allowing speech to be restricted. It is empowering Congress. It's empowering Congress during wartime, so there's lots of different kind of angles we could take with Schenck versus U.S. Um, what they said at that time was that speech can be limited if it creates a clear and present danger. Again, that is no longer true today, as I think Emily was that mentioned it, um, Schenck is, has been overruled. It is now imminent lawless action. That's the, the new threshold. Don't worry about that. What you want to worry about is that this is the first time that the Supreme Court allowed time, place, and manner restrictions on free speech. That's the phrase that I want you guys to be using. Time, place, and manner restrictions on free speech. Um, that's what Schenck allowed, and that is still true today. Even if clear and present danger is no longer true, Time, place, and manner is true today. Um, First Amendment does not protect urging unlawful conduct. Again, when we do the speech, the uh, the case review tomorrow, we can go over that a little bit more. But again, yeah, Congress had passed a law that didn't allow people to criticize the government during wartime, and the Supreme Court was like, yeah, First Amendment doesn't protect that. So it's there's some speech that's not protected. Um, all right. Kai, yes, unit two is going to be the biggest unit covered on the AP test. Um, Amanda, yes, you can use the Supreme Court as an example in the essay. Oliver, um, so the Lumman test only to the government only. So again, that's a good example. Don't use the word government in an FRQ or the argument essay. Specify which government you're talking about. Are you talking about federal government or state governments? I have scored AP exams where the student says government and we are not allowed to assume which government. You gotta specify, so don't do that. Um, but yeah, lemon test is still a thing today. Um, Citizens United does not overrule the time restrictions. Um, on that one particular issue, it does, because it strikes down the 30 days and 60 days. You were right about that, Geronimo. Um, but no, there can still be time restrictions on speech. Um, and a good example of that would be on election day, time, place, and manner. Um, if you're at a polling precinct, there can be rules and regulations that say how far away you have to be to have to be like um, encouraging people to vote for somebody. So like, like campaigning for somebody. Uh, normally, you could do it in that place, but you can't do it at that time in that place. So there are still time, place, manner restrictions. Okay. All right. Tinker versus Des Moines. This is a pro free speech ruling. Again, I'll talk more about this tomorrow. Uh, the big thing is that students have free speech at school. I know that it doesn't always feel like that, and maybe some administrators could be reminded of this lesson a little bit more often. Maybe some teachers could be reminded of this a little bit more often, um, but students do have free speech. That's the big takeaway. Don't focus on, the, on when it can be limited, because then you might get confused about whether Tinker is pro-speech or anti-speech. Tinker is 100% a victory for free speech advocates. This is a pro-speech ruling. Pre-Tinker, students at school did not have free speech. This is definitely pro-free speech. Um, it also says that symbolic speech is pure speech. All right, so these are both uh, parts of Tinker versus Des Moines. New York Times versus U.S., very similar. Um, we see it's a similar era two years after Tinker, and the court, again, they were pro-free speech in 1969. Now in 1971, they are pro-freedom of the press. So they go hand in hand. They did not allow the government to block the publication of the Pentagon Papers. Um, they ruled against prior restraint is the term. Again, that will be in tomorrow's video. And by the way, if you need to check out the Supreme Court cases, I highly encourage you to do that. Don't wait for the live review. Watch the other video, and then you can hopefully have, if you have questions, hopefully you don't. Hopefully I explain it so amazingly that you don't have questions. I'm sure you will. Um, but then you can have the questions in the chat, and I'll 
I'll elaborate obviously and we can do that together. So I'd encourage you, watch the uh, required case video between now and tomorrow when we have that live review. But again, you'll get more of that. Prior restraint means censorship, and the government here wanted to censor the New York Times and the Washington Post, and the Supreme Court went against that. All right, so this again would be an anti-government, so this is limiting government power, just like uh, Tinker was limiting government power, expanding individual rights, expanding civil liberties, that kind of stuff. All right. Um, fourth Amendment, so shifting gears from the first to now the fourth, um, a legal search. One of three ways that a search by a police officer can be legal or reasonable, according to the Fourth Amendment, right? Fourth Amendment says that there can be no unreasonable searches and seizures, but then it lays out what reasonable is. You must have probable cause, must have a search warrant, or consent. Consent does make a search legal and valid. Um, so even if an officer were to lie, and I don't want to go too far down this road because I could talk about this for a while and get distracted, but even if an officer were to lie and say, you have to let me search that, and you're like, oh, crap, all right, you can search my car. Even if he was lying, you have now consented to the search, and that search is legal. So probable cause, warrant, or um, consent. That would make a search legal, okay? Um, now we have something known as the exclusionary rule. Because it turns out that for like until 1914, nothing would happen if police searched you unreasonably. So they'd search you illegally, no warrant, no cause, no consent, and then they would go ahead and arrest you and throw you in jail and use that evidence against you at trial. Now we have something known as the exclusionary rule. It was established in 1914. It was incorporated in 1961, a case called Map versus Ohio that you do not need to know by name. And it says that illegally obtained evidence cannot be used in trial. Again, this is a great topic for the AP Gov argument essay um, because that argument essay needs you to take a side. And so we can debate the exclusionary rule, right, about whether we have this idea of liberty versus safety and order. This is obviously protecting liberty, right? It is making people more free. It is protecting the rights of the accused. It is limiting government power, which Americans tend to like all those things. But... It could mean sometimes that somebody who is actually guilty of a crime, they might get away with that crime because the evidence was obtained illegally, then that evidence is thrown out, can't be used in a trial, and so now maybe some people don't like this because they could feel like they're less secure um, and less safe because of that. So um, that is possible. So again, I would suggest focusing on the Fourth Amendment as a great potential argument essay topic. Um, the rights of the accused in general, really. So not just the specified, just the fourth, because you have Miranda rule. And then next thing we're going to talk about also that same idea of that liberty versus security thing. So we, I think this one we don't need to go over very much. Um, the Miranda rule, um, everybody's heard of the Miranda rights. Um, so when somebody is being arrested, it says suspects in custody. So they're putting the cuffs on them. And then we hear those famous words, right? You have the right to remain silent. Uh, you have the right to an attorney blah, 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 anything you say can and will be used against you in a work, uh, court of law, all that kind of stuff. We know that that's there. Um, so that's your Miranda rights. It's important to note that the Miranda rule does not actually establish or give anybody any new rights that didn't already exist. So there's nothing new for Miranda. The only new thing is that now police must inform suspects in custody of those rights. Um, so it doesn't actually add to their rights just as they got to tell people. Now, there is an exception to that. That exception is known as the public safety exception. And that says basically that if there is something dangerous happening at that moment and the police were to ask a question to a suspect um, and they were to answer that question voluntarily, so freely they answer it, to put down that dangerous situation where people could be harmed, that statement, so if they were to respond and tell where the gun is, that statement can be used against them in a trial, even though they have not been told their Miranda rights yet. Um, so that is an exception. Again, this gives us a good part of this balance, right, between liberty and order. So you have the liberty side, you got to tell people their rights. But then the order, security, safety side is saying, yeah, but if something dangerous is happening, we'll go ahead and pretend like that doesn't matter. Um, so you have the same thing with the exclusionary rule. There have been ways that it's been limited. Um, so, yeah. Um, okay. Real quick, how is Miranda not a need to know? Scotus case, they didn't make us do that one. Um, Ab Abdu says, I'm confused about whether you need probable cause to issue a search warrant 
or if you just need probable cause or a search warrant to search someone. Uh, you need either probable cause, a warrant, or consent. Now, your question is a good one. It's beyond the scope of what we're going to do today. But when does a judge give a search warrant? If there's probable cause. So essentially view it as this way. Um, if an officer sees somebody run out of a 7-Eleven and they have a gun in their hand and they're running away, that officer has probable cause to search that person, to chase after them, right? They don't need to get a warrant for that. They clearly have probable cause. Let's say that it's not a high impact situation where somebody is running from them. They have somebody pulled over. They believe that they have probable cause because they believe that they see something illegal sitting on the passenger seat. Rather than risk it, because remember, if a judge later on decides that that evidence was obtained illegally, rather than risk it, their judgment of what's probable cause and what's not, get a warrant. It's all electronic these days. Request from a judge. Can you give me a search warrant? Here's my probable cause. I see illegal drugs in the passenger seat. They get the electronic warrant sent over. Now they have both probable cause and a warrant. Technically, you only need one or the other. So I hope that answers your question. You don't need that for the AP test. So sorry for going into too much detail on that one. Gideon versus Wainwright. This is an important case. All right. Um, incorporated the right to an attorney. Again, we'll go over this more in the required case video tomorrow. It incorporated the right to an attorney. So states now must provide a uh, defendant with an attorney if they can't afford one. By the way, you guys do me a favor. Um, if this is helping at all, help me out. Hit that like button. Um, don't forget to do that. I really do appreciate it so much. Helps YouTube to like me just a little bit more. Um, so that would be great if you can do that. And if you haven't subscribed, um, definitely make sure you subscribe and check out my other stuff. All right. Um, right of privacy, not specifically listed in the Bill of Rights. So it is nowhere to be found directly. Um, the court discovered it. We don't need to worry about how they discovered it. We don't need to know the name of Griswold versus Connecticut. Um, it is kind of based on the Fourth Amendment, though, the right of not to be searched unreasonably. That's a major part of it. Um, but the big thing here is that it has been used in Roe versus Wade to establish a right to an abortion. All right. And speaking of Roe versus Wade, again, I don't expect the AP, the College Board, to ask you to um, make an argument essay about Roe. They could absolutely just expect you to know it. That would be for like the concept application. I wouldn't think that this would be an argument essay topic, a little too controversial here. Um, states cannot ban abortion. So again, I'm not going to get into um, any sides on this issue, right down the middle neutral on this one. Uh, states cannot ban abortion, and why can't they ban abortion? Because of the right of privacy. So you have where privacy is incorporated clearly here, the right to abortion is guaranteed, um, and I think that's what we need to know about that. There is a Supreme Court ruling coming up on that issue, which you guys might want to pay attention to and uh, you know stay abreast of. All right, again, this is our big picture idea, liberty versus order. So it's that idea of um, how much liberty, how much security and, and free uh, should we have? So the balance between security and safety versus freedom and liberty. So a couple of examples here, the gun rights versus gun control debate. Again, that would make a really good argument essay prompt. It's also a pretty heated debate and topic, so I don't know if they would do that or not, but it would work. One that's a little less contentious, debates over government surveillance of electronic metadata. Um, should police be able to uh, use your like the GPS ability uh, on your phone to track somebody's location without a search warrant or to know where you were when a certain call was placed. Um, should they be allowed to do that without a warrant? Um, should they be able to look at your phone without a search warrant? Um, those sorts of things. So you have some good topics there about yes because it makes people safer or no because it violates the Fourth Amendment, that kind of thing. All right. Um, McDonald versus Chicago incorporated the right to bear arms. Again, look at the year on this one. It's again a good example of selective incorporation because this just now happened. Again, the idea here is that that means that one or that before 2010, a state could have restricted your right to bear arms. Um, they cannot take away your right to bear arms anymore. They can regulate it. They can have certain restrictions. Again, we just had a Supreme Court case about that as well, like earlier, like I don't know, a month ago, they just ruled. All right, so shifting gears, last five or six minutes or so. Civil rights, like we talked about, we were talking about protecting groups of people from discrimination. Civil liberties, we're protecting individuals from the government. Now we are empowering the government with civil rights to protect people from discrimination. Major, major difference. 
Um, I'm not going to go over specific examples. You guys should be familiar with this from APUSH. We've studied a lot of civil rights, I think, in your time during school, I hope. Um, but you have some examples where government laws were passed that were clearly discriminatory, probably still are, in fact. Um, but you have some specific examples there. And then we talk about how some of those things have been like uh, wound down and have changed over time through the Supreme Court and through legislation. So we have three ways um, that some of these things have changed, expansion of voting rights. The civil rights ones would really be the 15th and 19th um, because you're saying that race can't be a barrier to voting anymore. The 15th Amendment, 19th Amendment says gender can't be a barrier to voting. Um, so those are definitely expansions of uh, civil rights based on group characteristic, meaning uh, race or gender. Um, Voting Rights Act of 1965, that's these two laws, Voting Rights Act and then the 24th Amendment, together, that's what actually allows minorities to finally be able to exercise the right to vote. Um, happens 95 years after the 15th Amendment. And once those Jim Crow laws started, um, it was there was very very low voter turnout um, for African Americans, especially in southern states, because those states did everything they could to stop them from voting, having things like literacy tests and poll taxes, having exceptions to those rules for poor white people, so the poor white people could still vote, the illiterate white people could vote, um, poor black people couldn't vote, putting all sorts of obstacles. Right, Voting Rights Act, huge monumental piece of legislation, banned literacy tests, it banned other obstacles to vote. Um, I don't want to get into the second part too much right now, but it's the part that's relevant for Shaw versus Reno. Required states with a history of voting discrimination. Uh, sorry, I read that. My emphasis was poor, so let me try that again. It required that states with a history of voting discrimination had to obtain federal approval for their for changes to their election laws and policies. So the federal government had to approve if they'd redraw their map to make sure that they weren't doing it to exclude minorities or to harm minority uh, representation. Shaw versus Reno is a case that gets involved in that issue. Again, tomorrow when we go over the required cases, great time to discuss that. All right, um, again, big picture idea talking about how social movements have been used to influence public policy. The civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s had several legislative successes. Got the Civil Rights Act passed, the 24th Amendment, the Voting Rights Act. Those are major, major victories. Women's rights movement, again, you have same time period, 1960s, 70s major uh, legislative successes. You have things like the Equal Pay Act, which is exactly what it sounds like. Civil Rights Act also, so it was not just race, it also dealt with gender. And then one called Title IX of the Educational Amendments of 1972. I hate the name of it, it's very, very long. It was on last year's AP exam. Um, that's the one, if you are um, a girl who plays sports in public school, this is the reason why. It was talking about gender equality, um, if a program is offered at a public school that boys have an opportunity to do, then girls have to also. Um, Civil Rights Act specifically banned discrimination based on race, color, gender, religion, or national origin in public accommodations or employment. So what that really means in simple terms is that you can't get hired or not hired or fired because of your race, color, gender, religion, national origin. Um, if Public accommodations. If you have a company that serves the public, it can be a private company, so McDonald's, um, a shopping mall, a movie theater, um, a bus, anything that serves the public, they cannot deny you the ability to come into their store and to be served and all that based on your race, color, gender, religion, or national origin. These are protected classes according to the Civil Rights Act. There are additional protected classes in a lot of states. And there are even additional protected classes at the federal level, um, but this is specifically what the Civil Rights Act of 1964 said, okay? Um, almost at the end here, we have something known as affirmative action. The idea here was to give preferential treatment and for uh, minorities when it comes to college admissions and hiring. Um, this is implemented in the 1960s when clearly there was a lot of discrimination and prejudice that minorities would face when it came to hiring and college admission processes. Um, it is still allowed today, but it has been restricted. Um, so race can be a factor that can be considered. It cannot be the factor. Um, you cannot have a racial quota system. Quota means a certain number. So let's say that a university was going to accept 1,000 students this semester. They could not say, all right, of the 1,000, 700 will be white, um, 150 will be Hispanic, 
150 will be African American. They can't do that sort of thing. Um, so no quota system. And then um, they can't award points for race. I wouldn't worry about that one too much. Affirmative action this year, I would focus on um, that last question. So I'd, I would know that it's allowed. I'd know that there's no quota system. And then here's the good question. Does the 14th Amendment prohibit any race-based legal distinctions? Or does it merely prohibit race-based legal distinctions intended to harm minorities? So the idea here is that affirmative action, people who support it, they support it because of the Equal Protection Clause. The 14th Amendment says that you have to, you can't treat people unequally under law, right? You have to treat them equally under law. And so they would say, all right, white people have these advantages. Minorities are not having the same opportunity. So let's give minorities a boost to help them to have an equal chance, right? Opponents of affirmative action say, yeah, but now when you're giving a boost to one group, you're not treating them equally. So the weird thing about this, and it's why it makes such a really good argument essay, is that the argument for and the argument against, they both cent are centered around the same exact thing, which is the 14th Amendment and the Equal Protection Clause. It just depends on whether you think that the purpose of the Equal Protection Clause is to say you can never look at race, no matter what, or if it's to say, don't look at race unless you're trying to help a disadvantaged group. In that case, it's okay. You can't help the majority, you can't harm the minority, but you can boost the minority. So that debate lives on. All right, and so, I'll go ahead and do it now. This has been a La Money production. All right, so that was just in case so I didn't forget because I have forgotten a few times here. That's not where I meant to go. Um, so that is pretty much it um, for this video. I tell you what, let me glance over at the chat, um, see if there's any questions that are like on topic. I'll try to answer those real quick and get you guys out of here. We're going to be back at 1 p.m. Um, bump, bump, bump. Dun, dun, dun. How many official? Yeah, so you guys are talking about the essays and stuff that is available for you over on College Board's websites and stuff like that. Um, you don't have to, yeah. All right, so there's not really any questions that I'm seeing here. That's okay. Um, all right, so the Kahoot is going to be at 1 p.m. All right, so Kahoot at 1 o'clock. Uh, it's going to be on Unit 3. It's going to be 15 questions, so a little bit shorter than the last one. Unit 3 is a little bit shorter of a unit. Um, than the others. So 15 question Kahoot. We'll do that at one o'clock together. I hope to see everybody back. Again, you guys do me a huge favor. Um, hit that like button. So many of you already have, and I really, really do appreciate it. Um, that's what YouTube wants. They want to see likes. They want to see comments. So uh, it really does help me out, and I appreciate it. Um, in the description down below, there are some links for you guys. So I have the uh, links provided for the uh, official practice FRQs from College Board, including the one that I'm going to go over at 2 o'clock today. So if you want to glance at that, if you want to even write out that FRQ between now and 2 o'clock, that might be a really good idea. See how you did on it, and then I'll go through that um, in that 2 o'clock video. A couple other links from College Board um, about things to help you to get ready for this test. All right, so hope those things help. Um, real quick, just glancing at the chat again. Um, judicial review established by Marbury vs. Madison. Yeah, that's right. Is judicial review informal? Ooh, that's a good question. I, you wouldn't be asked that. They ask about president and formal and informal powers. I've never seen them refer to uh, judicial powers as formal or informal. It is not written in the Constitution, though, so I think that's what you're looking for. And so people are saying informal. I get it, because it's not written in the Constitution. All right, so that's it. I did say it's been a little money production already. Um, you guys have a great rest of your day. Hopefully have a great 22 minutes because I'll be right back in 22 minutes uh, to see you again. So see you guys shortly. Have a good one. Thanks so much.